Hello all, yes, greetings from and to the deep freeze. I hope everyone is staying warm. Or if you're in Australia, I hope you are staying reasonably cool. I'm not going to explain this today. That will be Feedback Friday stuff. Uh, today is the next installment in my mini series on the history of free speech concepts. If you like this, help support this channel, become a monthly patron, patreon.com slash Leanna K, because this took, or the PayPal, if you hate patron, um, because this one took a lot of work. Oh my God, I always quit. I almost quit multiple times, having to deal with Hobbes and Rousseau and Kant. You guys know how I feel about Kant. And, uh, oh God, what else? Uh, John Locke, uh, bouncing around. Oh my God. Dip my toe in so many enlightened philosophers. My brain feels like mush, but I have attempted to distill it as much as I can. Um, obviously this is not a complete treatise of the time period. I will remind you of this as I go on, but, um, Hopefully it gives you a sense of this period in history and, and what it it was sort of doing broad strokes. There was so much going on in a relatively short period of time, so it is very tough to distill. But where we left off in our story was uh, ancient Athens, Athenian free speech. Now we're going to fast forward through a lot of history, so bear with me. Uh, the infighting in ancient Greece among Sparta and Athens and all that stuff led to it being pretty easy to conquer by Alexander of Macedon, better known as Alexander the Great. After Alexander's death, the Macedonian Empire crumbled and the Romans conquered Greece in 146 CE. That's AD for those of you who don't do the politically correct terminology. By the 4th century, Rome was overextended to rely on slave labor, increasingly corrupt and weakened by the spread of early Christianity. In 410 CE, the Visigoths sacked the city of Rome. This ushered in the Middle Ages, also known colloquially as the Dark Ages. Cue about a thousand years of Europe being a collection of shithole countries. See what I did there? Where any speech seemed to be against God was profoundly restricted. Eventually, history reached the Renaissance and the 1439-1440-ish invention of the Gutenberg movable type printing press. In an era popularly defined more by global exploration, think Christopher Columbus, and da Vinci's inventions, the printing press was, without exaggeration, one of the most important inventions in the history of mankind. Printing presses could eventually produce up to about 1,500 printed pages per workday. In 1620, the Dutch press dropped the cost of pamphlet printing significantly, and this was a huge leap forward in the democratization of ideas, with ideas spreading via the written word, produced relatively quickly, and in local languages instead of in Latin. Of course, with the rise of mass-produced written documents came the, the, excuse me, the formalization of censorship. For hundreds of years, it had been relatively easy for governments and churches, which were often essentially the same thing, to censure written materials, censor written materials, excuse me, since it was often members of the clergy who hand-copied books. Monarchs in the Catholic Church switched to tightly controlling the printing of books by controlling European universities and the printing presses the books were printed on. The Index Librorum Prohibitorum, or Index of Prohibited Books, determined which books were considered unfit to mass produce. When newspapers began to proliferate, proliferate in the 1600s, the censors insisted on licenses for those too. John Milton infamously opposed this censoring of the press in a speech to British Parliament in 1644. But this theocracy, or theocracies, couldn't control low-cost, quick turnaround pamphlet printing in the same way. And these often anonymously written pamphlets became a form of proto-social media with all the fears that would lead with all the fears that it would lead to the downfall of society that we've come to expect 
regarding democratized speech platforms. The pamphlet writers of the 16th and 17th centuries were the shit posters of their day, printing insulting, even defamatory claims about public figures, sometimes of dubious social or information value. Fake news was as big a problem then as it is today, especially since large portions of the population couldn't read and got their news when it was read aloud in the town square. So one defamatory comment could spread all over a country in a relatively short period of time with nothing to counteract it. And much like the internet of today, great social change was powered by those pamphlets when they weren't shitposting. The first big upheaval was the Protestant Reformation, which would not have been able to take root were it not for the mass printing of the Bible and pamphlets to disseminate Martin Luther's protest ideas against his perception of the corruption and excesses in the Catholic Church. The ensuing persecution of Protestants across Europe led to the calls for religious tolerance that framed the next major philosophical shift in Europe, shift, I said shift, in Europe that marked for many the beginning of the modern age. This period was called the Enlightenment. And that's what we're going to focus on. We're finally here. That was a lot of history to blow through. The Enlightenment lasted from around 1715, which was the death of Louis XIV, to 1789, which was the start of the French Revolution. Now, these dates are not hard and fast. People quibble about this. It doesn't matter. You get the basic time frame. One of the other central concepts of the Enlightenment connected to this freedom of religion and religious tolerance was the separation of church and state. And this meant the need for secular rules. Cue a huge boom in philosophy. It's hard to quickly describe the magnitude of cultural change during the Enlightenment. The Western world changed completely, shifting from a series of monarchies backed by church structures to governments elected by the citizenry. There was a lot of bloodshed to follow, not just in the U.S. War of Independence and eventually the U.S. Civil War, but also the notorious French Reign of Terror. But one of the lasting ideas of the Enlightenment was this concept of inalienable inalienable rights. This started with John Locke's theory. Here we go, John Locke, that all people were born as blank slates and we develop ideas by experiencing the world through our senses. This school of thought, inspired by the rise of experimental science, yes, at one point experimental science was new, would become known as empiricism. And this paved the way to the idea that all people are created equal because it's much easier to argue for equality when you believe that all people are born as blank slates. The previous idea was that people were born into a socioeconomic caste, so to speak, as an act of God. And kings and nobles were just better than everybody else, ordained by God, which was why they were richer and more powerful. This was actually what the zeitgeist was. That's how big a shift it was. Now, this, of course, is a highly reductive version of these ideas. If you want to read the hundreds of pages of various philosophical theories on your own time, knock yourself out. I am on a clock here. We're already at eight minutes, eight minutes and change. Yeah, okay. What's important here is that John Locke touched on the idea of freedom of speech, freedom of expression, though he actually thought property rights were more important. Locke's concept of freedom of speech was inextricably tied to the idea of representative government. Freedom of speech may have even stayed a sidebar in philosophy were it not for that huge social change driven by that printing press and the need to protect a free press, meaning newspapers, from government censorship and persecution. Now, even before shit went sideways during the French Revolution, later Enlightenment philosophers were already grappling with the idea, the problem of what, if any, practical limits should exist on freedom of expression. Now, remember, freedom of expression was seen as a means to an end. More on this in a bit. The competing ideas of those limits on freedom of expression were based on what ends free speech was a means to. So this wasn't the Isagoria, the public 
public participation of ancient Athens. This new thing was a theory of speech surrounding the printed as well as the spoken word at a time when philosophers were still fighting about just how humans acquired information and morality in the first place. I guess we're kind of still fighting about that. Empiricists like John Locke had been challenged in the Enlightenment by the rationalist school of philosophy, which claimed that knowledge wasn't just obtained through sensory perception, but it was instead deduced through reason, deductive reasoning, Sherlock Holmes, that thing, yeah. Late Enlightenment thinkers began to recognize the shortcomings of both empiricism, perceiving, per perceiving the world through the senses, and rationalism, Sherlock Holmes, deductive reasoning. So somewhat depressed by an overdose of skepticism, um, more late Enlightenment thinkers attempted to find a happy medium between rationalism and empiricism. One German philosopher managed to synergize rationalism and empiricism and borrow from Copernicus to reintroduce theological metaphysics. That philosopher was Immanuel Kant. While Kant was still a classical liberal, he was also laying the foundations of the philosophical school of idealism, a heavily flawed attempt to bring moral will back into results-based philosophy, again influenced by the Enlightenment scientific boom. To Kant, moral intent mattered regardless of outcome. So pure reason wasn't enough. There had to be some involvement of what he called a priori knowledge, morality that we know to be true and just before we even begin experiencing anything. Of course, many of us would call this belief, not knowledge, but Kant liked fancy names for things so he could avoid obvious religious uh, inspiration. Um, Kant drives diving in the wool skeptics insane, but Kant is important because he provided a foundational concept that Thomas Jefferson borrowed, self-evident truths. Of course, self-evident truths serve as the bedrock for the Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution, and its vaunted First Amendment. But getting back to these Enlightenment schools of philosophy, what empiricists, rationalists, and idealists all shared was the belief that while expression should be free, not all expression was equal. The fights among the various philosophical schools were all about who was right and who was wrong. Therefore, quality of speech, quality of speech, tended to be of greater concern than the right to say anything anybody wanted. This really differed from those Greek ideas I talked about of Isagoria and Parhesia because this idea of quality of speech was not about the risk of saying something unpopular. Unpopular views were flying all over the place. What this new idea was about was the idea that anything involving human thinking had an inherent value to begin with. This was a big deal because human beings were no longer just servants of the gods of the Catholic Church. Human beings were now increasingly seen as independent beings with free will and inherent value. Now, obviously, that didn't extend to everyone because slavery still existed, but you get the idea. Reading the philosophy of the Enlightenment, freedom of expression is treated more like a means to an end instead of a priority in and of itself. And that's really interesting. I didn't catch that until I... I immersed myself in all of it. I'm like, wait a minute. This wasn't what I thought it was. Now, there's a reason for this. European populations were still recovering from the intense religious persecution of the preceding few centuries. Ironically, the printing press had had a hand in that as well. It helped disseminate a book called uh, Malleus Maleficarum history's best-known treaties on witchcraft. Malleus Maleficarum was definitely in fake news territory. It was produced by a discredited clergyman with an overdeveloped interest in the sexual habits of one of the women he accused of witchcraft. Um, but Malleus Maleficarum was, at one point, the second most published book behind the Bible. The literal witch hunts, actual witch hunts, not the metaphorical ones, that preceded the Enlightenment 
enlightenment made enlightenment philosophers extremely sensitive to the first importance of the tolerance of ideas they disagreed with but at the same time they were acutely aware of the harm that malicious expression could cause speech therefore was just a method of testing ideas. And it was the quality of those ideas that really mattered, not the right to say anything and everything you wanted. A big tenant of the Enlightenment, one of the critical parts of it, was that an idea had to be backed up by something, either the observed facts of empiricism or the deductive reasoning of rationalism. But the point is, outside of parliaments, no one was guaranteed any sort of platform. Quite the opposite. Those intellectual elites of the various philosophical schools and scientific schools had to be convinced that you had something of merit to say. Now, what this ended up doing is it replaced the social and political elite of the church and monarchs with an intellectual elite class that preached that thought was the mark of individualism and all individuals were created equal. You probably see the disconnect there. While being told that all men were created equal, the working classes were still being kept out of philosophical and social discourse. Working classes meaning people who didn't own land. Worse, Philosophers like Rousseau, uh, here we go, Rousseau, insisted that the Hobbesian, Hobbes, um, if you wonder why the little characters in Fable are called Hobbes, it was because of the Hobbes, I, Hobbesian idea that life without society is, you know, um, chaotic, brutal, and short, which is what happens to those poor little guys who I think are kind of cute in Fable. Anyway, I'm digressing. Hobbesian social contracts, according to Rousseau, required individuals to be are you sitting down? Forced to be free by the social whole. This was actually accepted philosophy at the time. Forced to be free. Of course, forced compliance with anything is the exact opposite of liberty. And this was the fatal flaw in much Enlightenment philosophy. The intellectual idea that all men were equal just couldn't compete with a philosopher's tendency to believe in his own superiority. Of course, there was a huge disconnect between the ideas of liberty and equality that they were pushing and the practice of forced compliance for the greater good dictated by an intellectual ruling class. Now, this contributed to the rise of those bloody populist revolts, revolutions, most notably the French Revolution. You don't give people a small taste of freedom and equality and expect that to be enough. That never works. History is littered with examples of this. The bloodshed of these populist revolts marked the end of the Enlightenment, and speech got a lot less free in Europe because losing one's head was no longer just a metaphor. Interestingly, though, Britain may have staved off a similar bloody revolution of its own by fighting a philosophical war of words over the French Revolution through those pamphlets instead. And these pamphlet wars regarded uh, involved such intellectual luminaries as William Godwin, Thomas Paine, and Mary Wollstonecraft, one of Europe's earliest philosophers of a subject that would become known as feminism. It's interesting the way pamphlet writing took gender out of the idea of ideas because the identity of the speaker didn't have to be known. The same medium that ruined so many lives and led to so many deaths during the witch hunt phase also saved and improved many lives. Enlightenment thinkers didn't believe the medium was the message or the massage. Yes, I just invoked Marshall McLuhan. But that other bloody revolution in what became known as America would lead to the normalization of the idea of freedom of speech. In good Enlightenment fashion, the First Amendment treats freedom of speech as inseparable from freedom of religion. And the interpretation and application of the First Amendment has gone through its own evolution. And that will be the focus of the final video in this series. So if you liked what you just saw, if you found this informative, once again, help support this channel, become a monthly patron, patreon.com slash Leanna K. This is so much like what Enlightenment and Renaissance uh, thinkers had to do. Give me money, please, if you have it. Um, anyway, hope you enjoyed it. It was a lot to parse. So obviously there are going to be little inaccuracies here and there just to bridge in for time and oh my God, make it condensed. But hope you enjoyed it. 
Thanks for watching. Talk to you on Feedback Friday.